When Dylan Little was born nine years ago, it was immediately apparent to the doctors that something was amiss, his back displayed a dark red hue, contrasting starkly with the rest of his body which bore uncommon birthmarks, right after his arrival, Dylan was rushed to the NICU, it was soon determined that he was afflicted with a severe condition known as congenital melanocytic nevus, this covered about 80% of his delicate body with birthmarks, Cara, his mother. An air traffic controller based in Atlanta, Georgia, was utterly stunned at her first sight of her son, throughout her pregnancy, there had been no signs of any issues, all ultrasounds and checkups had proceeded without a hitch, yet, upon seeing her newborn, she encountered a reality far beyond what she had ever imagined, Dylan's back was entirely black and bleeding, and his face, arms, and legs were speckled with moles, the largest of these stretched from above his ears down to his bottom. Encompassing his shoulders, belly, and entire backside, he also had hundreds of smaller satellite moles, ranging in size from half a dollar to the size of a pen, as she later described in a 2016 interview with Kids Health, at just five weeks old. Dylan had already undergone a PET scan and an MRI to check for melanoma due to his rare condition, which affects only 1 in 20,000. This led to several melanin deposits in his brain, causing him to start experiencing seizures at around 4 months old. Doctors informed his parents, Karen and Nikki, that Dylan would need multiple surgeries in the first years of his life. Patients with congenital melanocytic nevus are at a heightened risk of developing skin cancer making it crucial to continuously monitor their birthmarks. The mole covering most of Dylan's back was so large that doctors planned a complex surgical removal. This procedure was not straightforward, as it involved transplanting skin from other parts of his body. As Dylan grew, his medical team opted for more intricate surgeries to generate sufficient skin for grafts. To facilitate this, they inserted implants similar to breast implants into the boy's body. Dylan carried these implants for three months, facilitating the growth of additional skin necessary for future procedures. The concept was to use the available extra skin to cover the region where the large mole on the young boy's back was located once it was removed. It's accurate to say that Dylan has endured numerous surgeries. To date, he has had 26 operations, and about half of his large mole has been successfully removed. We cling to the hope that the moles will never become cancerous, although there is always a possibility they might. His mother, Kara, informed the Telegraph that he undergoes surgery every three to six months, depending on the body part being treated. Despite undergoing numerous surgeries and spending much time in recovery, Dylan remains a cheerful child and has so far proved the doctors wrong. We're committed to doing what's best for him, striving to ensure he enjoys the longest, fullest life possible, Kara mentioned to the Telegraph. Dylan continually astonishes me. He always wears a smile and seems to practically own the hospital. All the nurses are familiar with him and adore him. Dylan is fully aware that he looks different from most children. When strangers stare at him in public, Dylan simply educates them about his appearance. Generally, people react kindly towards him, though there have been instances where the reactions were quite harsh. For example, once in a supermarket, a manager requested that we leave because a customer felt uncomfortable seeing our child, which was deeply distressing, Kara recounted. However, at the same time, Kara refuses to conceal or feel embarrassed about her son. I'm not scared to take him out at all, and I don't want him to feel anxious or think he has anything to be ashamed of, she clarified. Dylan's parents have set up a Facebook page for those interested in following his path to recovery. Kara often posts updates about their day-to-day -day life and is actively raising awareness about Dylan's condition. We are uncertain about what the future holds for him, days, weeks, years, or decades. That's why we are doing everything in our power to keep him with us, Kara stated in 2016. Today, Dylan has undergone 33 surgeries but still maintains a positive attitude towards life. He enjoys playing baseball, fishing, and spending time with his family and friends. At nine years old, He's healthier than ever and lives life to its fullest, however, Dylan still has remaining moles that require continuous monitoring to ensure they do not evolve adversely, despite this, Dylan continues to be hospitalized occasionally, yet, all surgeries have gone according to plan, and like the fighter he is, Dylan has persevered, every time we gaze upon this precious boy, we feel an immense sense of joy, today. We are so delighted that your parents are here to share in your life and witness your growth, filled with immense pride. If we possessed even a fraction of your extraordinary abilities, we would be truly thankful. God bless you, Dylan.
continue to be courageous and never surrender, Dylan is a courageous nine-year-old boy who is enduring a struggle that no child should ever have to face, no parent wishes to see their child in pain. And they will go to great lengths to ensure their child can feel better once more, we sincerely hope that the remainder of his surgeries proceed without any complications, please, share Dylan's story to pay tribute to this valiant young fighter, after watching this story, how do you feel, feel free to share with us in the comments section below. And then there's another similar warm story, let's continue to see. Richard Davis and his 62-year-old mother, Miranda, had resided alone for over a decade on a quaint farm just outside St. Francisville, following the tragic death of Richard's wife during childbirth. This event was meant to mark the joyous arrival of their first child. In the wake of this loss, Davis chose a reclusive lifestyle, opting to live with his mother on the family farm where he had been raised and cared for by his father until his father's passing. The dreams of parenthood and family life were pushed aside. And his new primary focus became caring for his mother and reviving the neglected farm business, which was close to collapse. It's also worth noting that the Davis family was African American, Richard's grandparents had migrated from Africa to the United States with barely $100 to their names. In earlier times, this background made them the focus of significant scrutiny and subjected them to various forms of aggression both in and out of their working environments. Despite the pervasive racism in America, Richard's grandparents and his father never let it deter them from pursuing their aspirations and leading a peaceful life in one of Louisiana's quietest towns. However, the core of this narrative isn't centered on the struggles of the Davis family farm or their battle against racism in the United States. Rather, it's about how Richard, a farmer who had shut himself off from the world, became entangled in an inspiring tale that is sure to touch your heart. This story unfolds with the unexpected arrival of six sextuplet nine-year-old sisters at the local orphanage, marking a pivotal change in the lives of the sisters and our reclusive farmer. The transformation began when the local orphanage enlisted the floral services of the Davises farm as part of an initiative to diversify the farm's operations. Richard had recently decided to allocate a portion of his farm for floriculture, offering floral services across the city to enhance his income. This shift not only reduced the farm's reliance on traditional agriculture like cattle and wheat but also rekindled Richard's passion and sense of purpose. Gardening wasn't the only new venture that sparked excitement in Richard's life. During a visit to the orphanage to discuss upcoming floral needs for a visit by their major sponsors, Richard encountered a distressing and heart-wrenching scene that deeply moved him. Six identical girls, each uniquely attired, entered a room, closely followed by one of the facility's supervisors. Nearby, a couple vehemently scolded them for reasons Davis couldn't grasp, however. He didn't need to comprehend their words to recognize the couple's disdain and the girl's evident distress and desperate need for love, a kind of love that seemed unattainable from such well-dressed yet haughty individuals. At that moment, Richard ceased paying attention to the director's instructions on arranging flowers and was deeply moved at the sight of the distressed girls. An uncontrollable urge to assist them and alleviate their apparent loneliness welled up inside him. Who are they? Richard interrupted the director, who was annoyed at the disruption but reluctantly shared the bleak history of the six sisters. They had been shuffled back to this, their ninth orphanage, within a mere month by their latest guardians, who were clearly unsuitable since becoming orphans. The sisters had continuously moved between various orphanages across the state, never managing to settle into new families, often because the families were not as fitting as they initially seemed. Known among the locals as the Cursed Six, their story was tragic, they had spent years in and out of institutions, always returning amid some scandal, despite attempts to separate them for easier placement, the sisters refused to be adopted individually, complicating their situation further. It's very complex for someone to adopt all six sisters at once, as I'm sure you can understand, the director explained. His interest in Richard primarily focused on his professional services rather than the well-being of the girls. When Richard continued to express concern for the sextuplets, ignoring further discussions on floral arrangements, the director became visibly frustrated and regretful about divulging their story. They aren't cursed, Richard remarked, observing the girls with compassion. It seems to me they just need a family that understands them and can give them the space to start trusting again. In one corner of the room, silence enveloped the pair as they discussed the unusual situation. Oh, of course, they aren't cursed, it's merely a jest, they're simply unique, was the gist of the conversation. 
the initial orphanage that welcomed them provided shelter for 18 months, which was the longest duration they had ever spent in such a facility. Upon their arrival there, the girls were visibly terrified, displaying symptoms indicative of post-traumatic stress disorder, necessitating several months of child therapy before they began to communicate, play, and mingle with other children. Only after this did the orphanage feel confident enough to initiate the adoption process. However, complications arose when attempts were made to adopt them individually, which led to the girls exhibiting anger and refusing to eat, despite these challenges. When a family was willing to adopt all six sisters, the situation didn't improve, the director shared in a somber tone. Davis, alarmed, inquired if they had been mistreated. The director paused briefly before revealing details that only heightened Davis's concern. The abuse they endured went beyond mistreatment. It was a severe case of domestic violence. The responsible couple was arrested and is currently incarcerated. For these six sisters, the physical suffering they endured had become secondary to their other fears. Back at the farm, Davis found his thoughts incessantly returning to the girls. At night, the sad, ghostly images of their faces haunted him, disrupting his sleep. It was during one of these restless nights that he made a spontaneous decision that would transform his life entirely, though he was yet to grasp the full impact of his choice. The next morning, when Richard disclosed his plan to adopt the sex duplets to his mother, Miranda, she was initially in disbelief. However, after discussing it for over an hour, she began to see the rationale behind his decision. It's your way of honoring Carrie's memory, isn't it? She always wanted a big family and believed you'd make an excellent father. By adopting these girls, you're filling the void left by Carrie's passing and fulfilling her last wish. She realized, that's understandable, dear. If this is truly what you desire, I support you, Miranda concluded, accepting his intentions to form a new, large family swiftly. Richard's mother finally embraced his desire to adopt six sisters from the orphanage, happily exclaiming that they would do their best to provide the family these girls dearly needed. The next day, the orphanage's administration breathed a sigh of relief upon Richard's confirmation of his intent to bring the girls to his farm outside the city. To ensure his sincerity, they posed several questions to verify his suitability as their guardian. Fortunately, his responses were satisfactory and there were no issues with Richard, a widowed black man living with his elderly mother. Becoming the adoptive father, in fact, he was deemed the perfect candidate to offer these cursed sisters a final chance at a familial love and a true home. Good luck, Mr. Davis, you are a courageous man, said the director as he shook Richard's hand. No need for luck, sir, the girls will be very happy with us, Richard confidently replied, giving a firm handshake. However, the transition wasn't as seamless as he had hoped. His mother, Miranda, eagerly anticipated meeting the girls and embracing her role as a grandmother. She cherished the children, and Richard had prepped her with the girls' stories to foster a seamless connection and understanding of their background. Miranda felt their sorrow deeply and was eager to make them feel welcomed and comforted. To her, the sex duplets were like the granddaughters she never had, now returned home, and she was committed to raising them properly as part of the Davis family. From the day the girls arrived, Richard met all their basic and additional needs indicated by his mother. He dedicated himself fully to his new role as the father of the six sisters, each unique in concerns but similar in their shy, reserved demeanor. Over time, with immense patience from all involved, the bond with their new family grew stronger, eventually feeling like the closest thing to a home they had ever known. The turning point occurred when Margaret, one of the sisters, Accidentally broke an antique vase dear to Miranda, terrified by the accident, she fled to hide in the farmhouse. When Miranda discovered what had happened, she went in search of the distressed little girl and found her in tears, hiding behind her son's tractor. Upon seeing the scene, Miranda's response was one of compassion and reassurance, further solidifying their bond as a family. Upon accidentally breaking the vase, Miranda immediately grasped the situation and sought to reassure the distraught girl. Don't worry, sweetheart, I'm not upset, it was just an old vase, and we'll get a nicer one, she said gently, extending her hand, tears streaming down her face, the girl stammered, you're not going to punish me, you won't send me back to the orphanage, absolutely not, it was just an accident, Margaret, no one will harm you, and no one will send you away, we are your family now, this is your home, Miranda replied, embracing her warmly, from that moment, Margaret and her five sisters truly felt that Richard and Miranda were their family, 
never again fearing a return to the orphanage. As time went on, each sister found her role on the farm, and together, they contributed to the flourishing family business, while some assisted Miranda with domestic chores. Others joined Richard in gardening, farming, and animal care. With six sisters, the workload on the farm was efficiently divided, which tripled the productivity and overall well-being of the family. Importantly, the girls relished these tasks, taking joy in being part of the family's endeavors, which brought warmth to Richard and his mother's hearts. Life improved significantly for the six sisters and Richard, filling his heart with love and gratitude over the years. Yet, the family's journey was to encounter more surprises and challenges, which they would face united, over the years. The sisters discovered a hidden talent they had previously concealed, singing. Each sister possessed a unique and enchanting voice that, when combined, produced a choral melody of stunning beauty, captivating all who listened. When the local choir director heard the sextuplets, she eagerly offered to mentor them, enhancing their vocal skills, excited about refining their talent. The girls embraced the opportunity to see how far they could progress as singers. Under the guidance of the choir director, the sisters began performing at various local events, festivals, and even national competitions, continuously honing their skills. Their community adored them and saw great potential in their future as singers, supporting their burgeoning careers with enthusiasm. As they matured, the enthusiasm for music among the sisters waned by the time they turned 19. They agreed that the state singing competition held each early summer would mark their final performance together. Following this, they planned to pursue individual paths. The competition's substantial prize money was a significant motivator for both the sisters and Richard, as it promised to cover their future college expenses, a goal they achieved when they won the contest, quickly becoming crowd favorites. Their victory in the prize money, however, also brought them internet fame which led to the revelation of a shocking secret that threatened to dismantle the stable life they had worked hard to establish over a decade. Within days of their triumph, the sisters received numerous enticing offers from various record labels, which they began to consider seriously. However, their plans took an unexpected turn when a mysterious woman appeared at the Davis farmhouse one night, claiming to be their biological mother and demanding a share of their earnings. Initially, Richard dismissed the woman as a mere overzealous fan, but his skepticism was challenged when she presented a photograph of herself holding six infants in a hospital, forcing him to confront the truth. The woman, named Diana, coolly asserted her claim, presenting the photo as undeniable proof of her maternity. The sisters were shocked to see a woman whose features mirrored their own so closely. She appeared worn and clearly in need of financial assistance indicating that her daughter's newfound success had presented her with a chance to alleviate her financial distress. Eventually, Richard and Miranda decided to invite Diana inside out of respect for their daughters, despite their reservations about her intentions. Once inside, Diana shared the entire backstory of the girl's birth and her subsequent decision to leave them at an orphanage due to her struggles with gambling and other vices, even during her pregnancy. Diana couldn't cease her gambling habits, squandering her resources at casinos, in no state to parent a single child, let alone six. She faced the challenges alone after the children's father vanished upon learning of his impending fatherhood. She made no effort to find him, recognizing he was just as detrimental to her daughters as she might have been. When she concluded her tale, Richard experienced a blend of pity and disdain towards her, yet deep inside, he felt thankful. Her actions had inadvertently led him to meet his six daughters and build the family he had always desired. You still don't love your daughters. You're here only to continue disrupting their lives. Am I incorrect? Davis accused her. They are my daughters. Like it or not, and as their mother, I maintain my rights. She responded, visibly disturbed, but Richard cut her off. You forfeited your right to be their mother the moment you chose to abandon them for the casino tables. So don't presume to tell me about your rights, Richard retorted angrily, causing Diana to shrink back at his vehement reaction. After consulting with his mother and observing his daughter's distress, Davis reluctantly agreed to write her a substantial check, hoping she would leave their lives forever. He was aware that the money wouldn't last, but he chose to act generously with someone undeserving. As a way to find peace with the situation and conclude the sorrowful narrative that had always loomed over his daughters, they never felt the absence of the one who was supposed to be their mother, because Richard had shown them the true essence of family in a loving home. Did this touching and surprising story move you? If so, we invite you to leave a comment with your thoughts. 
If you wish to explore more inspiring stories like this one, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for your cooperation.